Yeah, welcome to the webinar presentation covering the topic of the replacement of the historic Umama Stream Bridge. Um, I'd like to thank Midas for inviting me to be a presenter in this webinar series. Um, I chose Umama Bridge as the topic of discussion um, because although it has some unique design features, uh, it is a stringer bridge. And I think a lot of structural engineers that do consistent bridge design can, uh, can relate. <clears throat> So my name is Steven Peters, and I am a structural engineer for KSF Inc. Uh, We're located here in uh, Honolulu, Hawaii. Um, I'd like to discuss an overview of the bridge replacement project and some of the features of Midas Civil that help aid in the analysis of the structure at uh, some of the different limit states. Um, this this photo of me, you know, it's uh, it's actually an old photo, um, so I you know I'm just going to update it real fast if you guys don't mind. There we go. That's uh, that's more like it. That's uh, that's a more accurate photo I took this morning. So um, <laughs> we'll proceed with that one there. <clears throat> so a little bit about the bridge. Um, the bridge falls in the inventory of bridges owned by the Hawaii Department of Transportation. Um, the general contractor on the job is a Hawaiian Dredging Construction Company. Our company, KSF Inc., was hired by Hawaiian Dredging. Um, after the bids were awarded to provide a new design as part of a value engineering change proposal. Uh, Umama Bridge is located on the northeast side of the island of Hawaii. Uh, it's lo located along the Hamakua coast on a stretch of rural highway that's the main route between Hilo and Waimea. <coughs> The bridge traverses a fairly deep gorge that carries Umama stream directly to the ocean. You can see its vicinity right there with the, uh, with the ocean. The, the original bridge was um, constructed in 1910 and it spanned 281 feet. It was composed of six simply supported spans, uh, two lines of riveted steel plate girders which supported tracks that carried rail cars. Uh, the bridge was constructed during the booming sugarcane industry of Hawaii and also had a cane flume running along the uh, side of it used to float sugar canes down. Uh, then in uh, 1949, the bridge was widened and changed to a vehicular bridge. Um, there were other uh, steel, riveted steel bridges in the area that were being demolished. And uh, so those, those uh, girders were actually uh, dismantled from the other bridges and salvaged, modified as needed, and then they reused them as the additional two girder lines for uh, Umama. Uh, concrete deck was poured with sidewalks and railings, and the uh, steel trestles that um, were used to support the girders, they had to, under, they had to undergo uh, modifications to support the additional girder lines that were added. So uh, here's some sketches from the as-built drawings from 1949. You can imagine that the ones from 1910 uh, are pretty scarce. And so at this point, uh, the bridge is uh, over 100 years old and, and due for a replacement. Um, when a bridge gets that old, as-built drawings become scarce, condition uh, of the bridge becomes kind of uh, ambiguous, uh, so load rating results are hard to calculate. And since there's so much unknown about the material properties, actual suction properties of the girders um, made load ratings difficult. Um, so a lot of load rating engineers would have to err on the conservative side. Uh, so all this stuff kind of contributes to a need for a bridge replacement. So there were several key design considerations that need to be accounted for during the initial design phase. Um, high, high wind speeds. Uh, Hawaii is located in a hurricane-prone region with you know 105 mile per hour uh, wind speeds. Um, uh, the cranes that were going to be used at each of the abutments had an impact on the design considerations. Um, you know, they had already, they had already been chosen, and um, although, you know, it would be nice to pick a pair of 130-foot girders with 140-foot reach, that's just not the case, and so uh, it did affect the design. Um, many times, concrete girders are barged over to uh, Hawaii from the mainland. Uh, steel girders were most assuredly going to have to come via a ship. Uh, additionally, trucking capacities from the docks to the site had to be accounted for. Uh, daily vehicular traffic had to be accommodated, and the use of the routes that bypass Umama Bridge were not a viable option. Uh, Umama Bridge is listed on the Historic Register and is under the watchful eye of the State Historic Preservation Department. 
um, the original designer had to go through a pretty lengthy process of filing lots of paperwork, waiting years to get approval on design features. So the value engineering design team was not about to undo all this hard work. Um, any design changes that we were going to make had to be, uh, uh, you know, tactfully approached. Uh, since the original bridge was steel, replacing the bridge with concrete girders is out of the question. Uh, the steel girders would need to maintain the exact same layout and relatively similar girder heights. Uh, the existing steel trestles had to remain in place, even if not functional, and the original design utilized an aesthetic concrete railing, which we had to incorporate into our new design as well. Um, so, Umama stream is over 100 feet below the bridge superstructure, so any added substructure elements would, uh, would need to be tall. Um, Hawaii Island is also the most seismically active of all the islands. So the, um, the short period uh, horizontal um, spectral acceleration coefficient is 0.97 Gs, and the bridge is classified in seismic zone 4. Um, the original design that the contractor bid on aimed to actually reuse the existing girders and deck, um, and they were going to just pour a new concrete deck at the wide end portion where two new girder lines were to be added, um, and the girders were just going to remain simply supported. Um, so we wanted to provide something that would uh, serve the public a little bit better, give them more longevity out of the bridge life uh, with um, you know, less, less maintenance issues for the future. So it was decided that we were going to make the bridge um, with six new continuous girder lines instead of the originally proposed reuse simply supported girders. Uh, this further eliminated the need for any deck joints that always proved to be maintenance issues in the future. Um, cast new concrete piers were going to be uh, placed and they were, had to be kept within the existing steel trestle um, merely to keep the existing steel trestle as an aesthetic historic um, uh, feature. So the design aimed to reuse the existing abutments and we wanted to do it with um, with some rehabilitation work needed to be done, but we wanted to avoid the use of any deep foundations. So daily vehicular traffic was accommodated by erecting a one-lane temporary detour bridge alongside the existing Umama Bridge. The two interior piers and spread footings were constructed within the confines of the existing steel trestles. A geosynthetically reinforced soil backfill uh, was placed and aimed to reduce the load on the abutments. Uh, friction pendulum bearings um, were used and they provide the benefit of isolating the superstructure from the substructure and thus reducing the force in the substructure. Uh, the superstructure stringers were, were going to be made from welded steel plate girders and the deck was going to be made from individual precast post-tension deck panels with field cast UHPC joints. So here is a downstream elevation of the bridge. Um, very simple design. Uh, doesn't doesn't look anything too overly complex, but it's got some some unique design features incorporated into it. And for the typical cross section, um, so one thing you might notice is the the girder lines are stepped vertically when measured adjacent to each other, um, and that will. The purpose of that was to cut down on the amount of UHPC that was used because the material is rather expensive. So um, in full disclosure to date, it's everything still currently under construction. Uh, that was one reason I was a little hesitant to choose this bridge, um, just because I feel like it might be a bit taboo to give this webinar prior to its opening, uh, so I'm keeping my fingers crossed. But um, currently the contractor is placing the bearings, uh, setting steel girders, and precasting the deck panels at a nearby off-site location and storing them uh, in anticipation for the time when those will be set. So <clears throat> running through each of the design features, um, I want to discuss them a little bit more specifically. So. We worked closely with ACRO and got a one-lane detour um, bridge erected right adjacent Umama Bridge. 
and this has been providing a detour route for the entirety of the project so far. Uh, this is a rather important aspect of the overall design, because um, if you remember me saying the original design utilized the existing girders and deck, and they did construction work uh, with this. And so they were able to provide through traffic across the existing bridge. Um, but there were many reasons that we didn't want to, the V design to do this. Uh, this would have affected the construction time frame. And also, um, there would have been an inability to provide full width precast deck panels. Uh, so this would have necessitated a longitudinal closure pour somewhere along the deck. So here's the uh, acro towers erected, and then they're pushing out the acro trusses from the abutment side. So then onto the uh, post tension piers and on spread footings. Um, so the footings for the piers had to be like I said, designed to be kept within the confines of the trestle foundation. Um, this this was uh, a reduction in size over the original design um, considerably, and um, the foundation plan shows just that. You can see the existing uh, foundation for the trestles. Um, so the columns then were constructed right up the center of the existing trestle without conflicting with any of the steel members. And you can see the, uh, the pier cap extending out from the trestle and uh, everything's independent and the girders are actually being set in this photo. So again, the existing trestle is um, just an aesthetic element at this point. So it's, there's no, there is no load being transferred into the existing steel trestle but it was a requirement to keep it for historic purposes. And then the uh, pure elevation and lower column section showing the post-tensioning bars. So we, we decided to make the, um, a semi-integral abutment uh, where we would attach the, um, the back wall to the girders and uh, have a closure pour on top of the UHPC joint and set the um, approach slab on top of that and use a geosynthetically reinforced soil backfill or GRS backfill. Um, so the, the GRS backfill provides a stabilized soil mass behind the abutment that exerts minimal loading on the abutment itself while providing a resisting stiffness to the superstructure when it moves longitudinally during a seismic event. Um, no, no active earth pressures or mononobe forces act on the abutment stem when you use this uh, GRS system, and all forces uh, can be resolved at the footing level. So here the abutment is being retrofitted, wing walls are constructed, and soon ready to backfill. So for the pre cast deck panels. Um, it was nice that uh, David Liu gave that presentation a couple weeks back on Illinois' first precast uh, deck panel bridge with UHPC joints. Um, there seems to be a lot of interest in his presentation and plenty of questions asking about issues during construction. Um, I think this is, you know, this is a relatively new pro uh, topic, still undergoing a lot of research with FHWA. So this is uh, Hawaii's first UHPC uh, bridge as well. Um, so we're trying to work with the contractor and you know we're coming up with a plan try to plan out a lot of the details for the erection procedures but you know I imagine that there's still going to be a lot of infield learning curve in regards to a lot of the erection nuances so for Umama there are 21 individual deck panels all equal length being used um, the panels are cast as full width panels so there is no longitudinal joint in the bridge Um, the deck panels are post-tensioned in the transverse direction shortly after casting. Uh, post-tensioning in the longitudinal direction occurs after setting the panels on the bridge, but prior to UHPC grouting. So the contractor has, uh, is casting these himself and has set up a casting bed nearby to the bridge in an off-site location. Here's a picture of the, the bed. 
and uh, you can see the um, the reinforcing, the uh, PT ducts and the stud rails just prior to pouring concrete. And uh, here they are pouring concrete, doing a really good job of vibrating those panels. Um, here's another picture showing the uh, cave over each girder flange, and it's being blocked out with a, a block of polystyrene. Um, there's also, you see some uh, wiring for strain gauges that uh, is being run through the deck panel, uh, protruding into each cave, and um, there's some strain gauges that are going to monitor the behavior of the UHPC uh, during, during the service of the bridge. So on the underside of the cave, um, this is what sits over the girder flange, and this is going to be flooded with UHPC grout. Um, you can also see the uh, transverse reinforcing steel uh, sticking through that cave, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. And a uh, nicely roughened edge of a panel at a transverse joint location. Jacking operation of the transverse PT strands. And all these panels have to be lifted, stacked on top of each other, and stored for several months until the setting operation begins. Um, I'm not sure if you can tell from this picture, but if you look closely at the uh, strong back beam, you can see that it's kinked at the center. So this is what I was talking about earlier, about we have to maintain that 2% transverse cross slope. And so in order to do so, they're actually casting um, that, uh, that slope into the panel itself. Uh, and this goes for the top of the panel and the soffit of the panel. Um, there's not going to be any overlay port on this bridge when it's finished, so that's why they, they had to kind of get this uh, taken care of uh, during during the casting operation. Uh, there's, there's provisions for minimal grinding as necessary and grooving when finished. For the welded steel plate girders, um, they're rather standard. Um, we use 70 inch deep girders, grade 50 steel for both the web and flanges, uh, and cross bra bracing spaced at approximately 17 feet on center. Uh, we specified a three coat paint system for the girders using our organic zinc primer, uh, epoxy intermediate, and urethane top coat. Uh, all cross frames were hot dip galvanized, followed with the epoxy and urethane coats of paint. Um, I think the kettle, kettle limitations, kettle size limitations in, on the mainland were, um, you know, prohibitive for, for actually hot dip galvanizing the uh, girders themselves. So because we were using precast deck panels, particular attention needed to be given to the exact layout of the deck panels and subsequently the layout of the studded shear connectors to ensure no conflicts occurred between the two elements. So. Um, you know, I recommend providing extra studs and necessary in case fit-up tolerances aren't exactly how you expect. Um, you know, this way you can maybe lose a few lines of studs without any con con consequences. Um, so that 2% cross slope also affects the uh, cross bracing um, because the girders are vertically stepped in the transverse direction. Um, they're uh, vertically. Uh, they, um, we wanted to minimize that UHPC, but also we um, wanted to ensure that the the height of the haunch over the girders didn't get too large because if you start getting too too big on that haunch, you run the risk of excessive um, uh, you know pressures on the foam that uh, contain the UHPC. So you could have some blowout potential for that. Um, but it added a slight bit of complication uh, for the fabrication process since four of the five lines of cross frames had to be constructed um, like a parallelogram instead of a rectangle, um, but nothing that they can do. Uh, but since the girder spacing was irregular, you can imagine that they had to create multiple jigs, you know, just to fabricate these cross frames. Um, we had the cross frames fully welded and field bolted to the stiffener plates, um, which helps, of course, accelerate construction time. The cross frames over the abutments incorporated a double um, channel that was designed to transfer the sh transverse shear force from the superstructure to the abutment. 
Uh, this also served as a point of jacking for, for bridge bearing replacement in the far future. Uh, we had we had tried to closely calculate the tolerances on the EVA foam that would be blocking between the deck panel and girder flange. Uh, based on these limits, we specified a shear stud height uh, after burn down of three inches. Um, this put the top of the shear connector just below the bottom transverse reinforcing that was protruding through the cave of the precast deck panel, uh, which I show there in red. Um, so this is this is something that would not normally uh, be prudent since conventional wisdom tells you that you want the shear connectors to actually have a physical overlap with the rebar uh, so you can ensure you know horizontal shear forces are transferred between the two elements but that's that's kind of the the one of the big benefits of the use of this UHPC as it allows the shear mechanism to basically develop in the material itself and it can transfer that load across um, the gap and uh, you still get composite action so this is this is a particular area study that the FHWA has conducted numerous full size tests on with very favorable results. So one huge benefit of this is that when setting those precast deck panels, there's there ideally should be no conflict between the shear connectors and the transverse reinforcing through the cave. So this can save a considerable amount of construction time um, and you know peace of mind for the designer knowing that the iron workers aren't going to be hammering these, these shear studs down just to miss all the rebar during the erection uh, procedure. So we erected the uh, girders in five sections, two pieces over the interior piers, drop the back span pieces in, then drop the center span piece in. Uh, pieces over the piers had to be post tensioned down to the pier uh, for the interim. Um, for the most part, the contractor has been pretty much connecting the two, two adjacent girders together and setting them as pairs. He's been dropping the girders in, just about to bolt the splice plates. So the friction pendulum bearings um, were used to isolate the superstructure from the substructure. The use of these bearings uh, increases the structure's period and displacement versus that of an unisolated structure, um, but it has the benefit of decreasing the acceleration and then the load that is transferred into the substructure. Um, for this project, we worked with the bearing manufacturer and decided that the triple friction pendulum bearing would be best suited. The triple friction pendulum bearing has uh, the added benefit of a two-piece articulated slider that's uh, independent and free to slide across both the top and bottom concave. This essentially allows the bearing to have twice the deflecting capacity uh, of the original friction pendulum bearing without increasing the size or footprint of the bearing. Here's what they look like. You know, these bearings are pretty relatively small. Uh, have about 4.7 inches of displacement capacity. Um, you know, I'm sure you guys have seen pictures of you know some of the bearings they use on bridges in San Francisco Bay Area, where those bearings are like you know 10 feet in diameter, and you know you got someone standing right in the middle of it, and they look lost because it's so big. But these, you know, essentially do the exact same thing, just on a smaller scale. So here they are, uh, set at the abutments and piers. So the girders right now are sitting on temporary blocking, and uh, they're still connecting all the spans and trying to make them continuous. So after they do that and elevations have been verified, uh, the bearings are going to be bolted to the bottom of the girder uh, and grouted beneath the bottom concave, and then inside the shear lug block out as well. Um, then the blocking is going to be removed, and uh, you should get load transfer then into the uh, the bearing at that point. So, for for a bridge like this, um, you could run a uh, like a multi-mode spectral analysis if you're wanting to analyze it with these friction pendulum bearings. Um, you know, something like this would be uh, represent like a simplified in that method of analysis, and but it's not uncommonly used for se seismically isolated structures. Um, this method is based on 
representing the behavior of the isolator by modeling a linear elastic element with a stiffness equal to the effective stiffness of the element at the design level displacement. So in order to account for the actual energy dissipated from the isolation system by the true behavior of the hysteresis curve, um, the modes with greater periods than 0 0.8 times the effective period are isolated by scaling the response spectrum curve by a damping coefficient. And that's dependent on the bearing properties and the behavior of the bridge at the design level. So inherent in this approach is the, um, the need to perform an iterative analysis where the designer needs to adjust the effective stiffness of the linear elastic element and damping reduction factor until they can reach, achieve convergence on the assumed and calculated values of isolator displacement. Um, you know, this method of analysis is believed to be suitable for Umama Bridge since Umama is a straight bridge without any skewed supports, you know, very similar heights of the interior piers, uh, no abrupt changes in the superstructure stiffness, and relatively equal span lengths. And there's no other irregularities in the geometry either. But there are some stipulations that the designer should be aware of when performing this type of analysis. Um, and you can, you can refer to the AASHTO guide spec for seismic isolation design um, as a good reference material. So the bridge can't be classified as critical, must either be essential or other, um, otherwise the time history analysis needs to be performed. Um, structures with effective periods greater than three seconds also require nonlinear time history analysis, uh, so the designer should verify in the model that the effective period is indeed less than three seconds. For isolation systems where the effective damping uh, expresses a percentage of critical damping exceeds 30% of critical, um, then a three-dimensional nonlinear time history analysis should be performed. And um, you should also run it with the actual hysteresis curves of the isolation system. Um, and then when establishing the design forces of the substructure, um, the usual response modification factor R should be, but should be divided by 2, um, but it doesn't need to be taken less than 1.5. And the intent of this is to ensure that on average the substructure will behave essentially elastic for the design earthquake and ensures proper performance of the isolation system since you don't want your um, isolation system, you, since you want your isolation system to be the mechanism for um, dissipating energy and not the inelastic behavior of the substructure elements. So here you can see an actual hysteresis curve produced by the bearing manufacturer uh, during their quality control check they run um, by testing each of their production bearings because they want to ensure that you get proper coefficient of friction, uh, effective stiffness values, damping, all that's met with the dis uh, test displacement. So the shaded area within the hysteresis curve is the amount of energy dissipated per cycle. So the way that a designer can utilize this hysteresis curve when analyzing a bridge using a spectral analysis is by simplifying this uh, curve into two components. So from here you have a stiffness of the friction component and a stiffness of the pendulum component. Uh, and then an initial secant stiffness can be approximated from this force displacement curve. This stiffness should be used to represent that of the linear elastic element in two orthogonal directions. Um, you can see where if like the, the post elastic stiffness value, the KD, remains the same as your as your yield force, um, or I'm sorry, if the KD remains the same and your yield force FY remains the same, the the, the effective stiffness, the secant stiffness, can can change depending on the actual displacement resulting of your bearing in the finite element model. So this is where you would have to iterate it. And then this graphic represents the effect the use of a friction pendulum bearing has on your response spectrum curve. So the period of the bridge uh, increases, as I mentioned, and this decreases your acceleration. Um, and then the damping is taken into account um, for by isolating higher period modes and scaling the curve by a damping coefficient. So you can see this results in a sharp drop in the spectral acceleration 
for any modes with a period greater than 0.8 times the effective period. So for a bridge like Umau Mau, you can, you can model in a couple different ways. Um, some might be better for different behaviors. Uh, since this, is a, this bridge is straight with no skews, um, a grillage model would be sufficient for a lot of the behaviors that you might be looking to check. So kind of an old school way of doing it, but uh, still works pretty well. Furthermore, if you're looking to run Midas's steel design module, this would be the way you'd want to go. You'd specify the plate girder section via the composite section input option in the section tab. So the deck would be modeled as a cross beam element, uh, and you'd have multiple ones spaced incrementally. And those are essentially fictitious, but they help to distribute live loads to the stringer elements. You can model the cross frames using truss elements, and then uh, you know basically master slave the node at the bottom flange uh, to the to the top flange. And um, the moment distribution values are actually pretty accurate, <laughs> pretty accurate for a bridge like this. Um, you know, I just just ran this just as a quick test, and um, you know, like if if you if you ran the the black curve is based on Ashto uh, LRFD, uh, you could run that in brass to get you a nice nice output because that brass is based on just the, the distribution factors given in Ashto. And then if you ran that grillage model in Midas you would actually get a pretty close comparison, not, not too much of a difference. So you could see where Midas would be able to cut down a little bit. But uh, for me, as, as a designer, um, you know, for, for, for us, we, we typically always have to give load ratings with new bridge designs. And so um, I typically try not to, to design, you know, to the bare minimum because I always know that in the future these bridges are going to be load rated using a program like Brass that someone's not going to be running a you know, a, a structural analysis program like Midas or even a full full finite element model. <laughs> if the bridge were on a curve, um, you might want to consider at least modeling the deck with plate elements or even modeling the deck and stringers with plate elements. Um, depending on how finely you mesh the plates though, you might see a pretty significant increase in compu computing time. So here, if, if you did, um, you know, plate elements for the stringers as well as the deck. So if you were to go this route, um, one drawback is, you know, just, just using, I think, any civil, you know, any uh, structural analysis program. But with uh, MIDAS also, um, you know, it makes the method for extracting results from the program I'd say an order of magnitude higher, you know, just that much more difficult. So in past versions of Midas Civil, um, I'd always use the uh, local direction for some feature that they offered to find the result in shared moments in the structural elements. But the drawback with this is that it works, it works fine for static loads, but doesn't work so easily for moving loads. And um, in order to do that, you have to first convert the moving loads to static loads and then you can use the local direction for some uh, feature. But it's pretty time consuming. And um, so there's one feature that Midas offers, and I think it's been around for a couple years now. Uh, but I don't, I don't hear it kind of talked about too much. But I, I like this feature. It is um, the virtual beam uh, feature that Midas introduced. It's pretty handy. Um, and uh, if you set up your, your elements, if they're modeled, let's say, out of either all plate elements or even a, uh, if the stringer element's a line element and you're using your deck as, as plates, uh, you basically define your virtual beam under the properties tab and then um, you basically can extract the moving load results uh, directly from this feature as opposed to having to convert everything to a static load. Saves, saves a lot of time. In order to do something like this, and, and you know, this is just recommendations for um, any time you're working with Midas. I always recommend, you know, group, grouping everything. Um, you know, if you ever want to do construction stage analysis, 
um, you're, you're definitely getting to group items. Uh, makes your makes uh, modeling a lot easier. So you can do structure, boundary, load. <clears throat> so if if you were wanting to model an isolation system, you could um, you know if you're going to do a multimodal spectral analysis, like I said earlier, you can just uh, use elastic uh, links and then you basically model uh, so SDX would be your your vertical stiffness you know and your SDY and your SDZ would be the two orthogonal stiffnesses of the springs uh, which would represent the effective stiffness of the, uh, the isolation system so then you you know in Midas could get your your mode shapes and then um, you know, you can check your periods and uh, make sure that you have sufficient uh, modal participation in your masses. And then you can, you know, either do a um, CQC or a square root of the sum squared method to combine your modes. And um, then you can run your spectral acceleration and, um, you know, you can Again, like I talked about, scale that down based on the uh, amount of damping that you uh, see in your system. Um, one one tool also, uh, I don't know if a lot of people use this tool that Midas offers, but uh, I like that they have it built in. Is you know you can the moment curvature toolbox if you want. You can um, for for columns, piers, you can you can basically uh, calculate the moment curvature and uh, come up with the effective um, EI of your section. So for Umamo, um, the lower column, like I had said, was post-tension. So for something like that, you, you want to use uh, basically gross section properties. But for that upper neck of the column, that was not PT. So you can uh, actually scale down your effective section based on running the uh, moment curvature. So you can un input your your section, your uh, rebar, uh, put your axial force in, and you can get an idealized uh, moment curvature diagram. You can use that, you know, and then uh, scale down your your uh, ear or eye, depending on which way you want to do it. Any uh, any questions? Uh, thanks, Stephen. We let's take a look. Uh, there's a list of questions. Um, do you recall how to find the, the, the question box? Yep. Can you, do we have to switch screens though, Angel? No, no, no. Um, you should be able to just expand the, the menu. Do you see it? Yep. Okay. You don't need to take control back. No, no, no. You can... Uh, we can stay like this. That's a fine. Okay. It might be something related to your presentation, so you can keep the... Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, what was the reason or the need for the longitudinal PT pre-stressing in addition to the transverse PT? So the, um, the longitudinal PT, because, this, because we didn't have any joints and the girders were continuous, um, we wanted to ensure that we didn't get any cracking. So we actually strung uh, strands across the entire length of the bridge and then we uh, added strands additionally um, over the piers to um, ensure that you didn't get any cracking over the negative moment regions. And then the transverse PT was because <clears throat> you had those caves, if you remember those caves in the, uh, the bottom of the uh, plank, those basically are like an inverted control joint. So you had to squeeze that transversely because you want to, again, make sure that during the lifting, that is not going to be the point in which it cracks. Uh, please summarize again the reason for non-uniform girder spacings. Um, so if it were up to us, we would have done uniform girder spacings, but um, the, the historic requirement from the State Historic Preservation Department was that the girders needed to remain in the same orientation that they were um, originally. So um, that's 
that was that was the governing thing is is that they, that they needed it for historic reasons. Um, what was the friction value for this triple triple friction pendulum? Uh, yeah, I think uh, you, you you wrote zero point zero six to zero point zero eight. I believe it was zero point zero six to zero point zero nine was the um, was the uh, allowable values, and I believe it was I believe it was coming out at zero point zero eight during their tests. Uh, what is the seismic PGA for this bridge site? Um, Forty five. 45 percent, 0.45. What's the substructure cost savings realized by using the base isolation system? Um, well, I don't have, say, hard numbers to give on this, but, um, and I, I don't want to go too much into the original design, but, um, the, from the original design, they did not use uh, base isolation systems. To the VE design, the footings were reduced by 70 percent. So, um, but we never, per se, ran it without the um, isolation system. So it was kind of always from the beginning known that since we were in a high seismic area, tall columns, we were going to want to use a uh, isolation system. Uh, Midas handles the triple friction pendulum in the analysis directly without going through the iteration process. Is that the case? Um, are you? I wasn't sure if you're telling me or asking, but um, my understanding is that um, you Midas has a feature. And, and I might be wrong on this, you know, because I, I haven't delved into this part too much on MIDAS, but my understanding is that MIDAS has a feature that you can model um, the friction pendulum bearing, but um, my understanding is that that feature is intended for running time history analysis, um, and it's not a simple uh, linear, it's not modeling as a simple linear elastic element, but that was my understanding. But this is, you know, like I said, this is a pretty simplified, um, procedure so it's easy enough to do and um, you know anytime anytime you try to get into new features of the program you know one of the you, you might know about it but one of the biggest things is you know you have to run some tests you got to make sure that you understand those features um, and so um, you know this programs like this take years to, to be able to understand and and I haven't gone through every single feature of Midas, but um, this is just the way that it was run for this for this uh, project, this example. Just, just to uh, clarify on that aspect, it, it is um, possible. You add it directly to the to the bridge, and then, as you mentioned, you run the time history really seismic analysis. You don't go through the uh, other linear iteration process. But, but correct, but but meaning that you have to actually run through a time history analysis, correct? Yes, yes, you have to. Okay. You, you have to run the time history analysis, a seismic analysis. So that's you know that's that's fine. Um, you can do it. It just that again, that just takes again. That's an order of magnitude more um, knowledge that the designer has to have, the analyst has to have. It's it's more difficult to run. Not everyone can run that. So depending mm -hmm. on what your you know capabilities are as a as an analyst, you you maybe can only run a spectral analysis or you know so this this is like I said this is a simplified procedure, and you can tell the code is set up such that it allows you to run a multi-mode analysis as long as you meet those certain criteria because it obviously understands that that a time history analysis is can is time consuming right it's it's just extra steps for a designer to go through and so. They, they allow you an easier out, so you just use a simplified procedure. But but thank you for that clarification, Angel. Sure. Um, how is the abutment soil stiffness modeled? So the um, 
the soil stiffness behind the back wall, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that that's what you are um, referring to. So we, we um, typically kind of work with the geotech on this a lot, and um, our past practice has been to use um, you know, subgrade modulus values on the order of about 4 KSF per inch when it comes to uh, using GRS backfill as a um, passive resistance uh, medium for, uh, you know, superstructure movement into it. So that, that's, that's typically our, our practice when we, but, you know, we, we, like I said, we talk to the geotech typically and try to get those values from them. Uh, what were the crane sizes used for the paired girder picks, and where were the cranes placed on the site? Um, hold on. I, oh, you're asking questions that are definitely better suited for the contractor on this one. Um, oh, man, I was given some crane charts a while back. Um, oh, they got the 4100W crawler on one side. Has um, you know, Steven, if, uh, if you don't I'm have it, even if, try to make a fool of myself. Yeah, I can yeah, have yeah. the contractor provide better better information on that. Um, but they did have to. Uh, one interesting thing was they actually had to. Um, they excavated behind the abutments, and did the work that was necessary to rehab the abutments, extending the footing, building the wing walls, and then they actually had to backfill the abutments with just, you know, regular soil, drive the crane out onto that so they could lift the girders, and then the next step is to drive it back out, re-excavate, and then put the GRS in. So, you know, that's a timing thing, but if, if you're looking for specifics on um, crane weights or crane capacities, I'd have to get that from the contractor. Uh, how many lift points for precast deck panel and how much weight for each panel? So... Okay, so Let me let me let me get you that information. Let me get, if you, if you're looking for specifics, I'll get you that. We um we were picking with the Gracie leveling lifts, so um those were what we were going to use to pick from, and then that was what we were going to use to set the panels down on. Um, but let me get you weights and uh, exactly out on that one. Oh, so the next question: How do you lift the precast deck? So um. This this Gracie uh, leveling lift lift system, um, it's basically a base plate with a uh, hollow uh, bar with a threaded insert in it. It's uh, cast into the concrete deck panel itself, and then um, has a threaded insert that you basically thread into the uh, from the top, and you can pick it up from that. And then you can use those the threaded part to basically. Uh, thread into the Gracie lift and to level it up. So you basically bring the precast panel up when it's set on the girders, and if you have multiple point, multiple points, you can you can level it from the multiple points. The three spring bridge. So how many expansion fixed bearings does the bridge have? Well, there's there's no there's no fixed bearings at this at this bridge. So since they're all friction pendulum bearings, the only restraint you have on the bridge is in the transverse direction uh, at each of the abutments. So um, there's yeah there's no there's no uh, fixed bearings per se. And then I think there's one last question. Is the soil stiffness modeled in 
modeled in the model on this project? Thanks for clarifications. Um, so, uh, yes, the the again back to back to soil stiffness. I'm guessing they're referring to the soil stiffness behind the back wall, and um, that was an important aspect of the um, seismic analysis. Is that we were relying on the like I said the 4KSF as a um, as a stiffness in the longitudinal direction. So it uh, it definitely helps to to uh, resist the forces in that direction. Um, so yes, yes it was. And yeah. that that about wraps that it? wraps it up. Yeah, thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, yes. <laughs> so thank you again for your time and everybody for for their time as well. And we'll be posting the the video, the recording uh, up in our page soon and getting sending out the emails with with the link. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. Bye. Thanks, Angel.